This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me is Richard Fields on the bottom today, and we've got John Cameron on the other side. Gentlemen, um, Gun Rock, the Aggies, for, the, for those who aren't, who aren't uh, initiated, around here in Sacramento, UC Davis is just down the street, and the UC Davis Aggies is their uh, is their mascot, is the what the uh, team name is the Aggies, and their mascot has been this thing called Gun Rock, which is a, a a Mustang, but apparently that is problematic because in lore, Gun Rock's father was a thoroughbred horse racehorse, and that is problematic, and so now they have changed the the students have voted to change their their mascot to a cow, which personally Ooh. I think. Probably Probably fits the modern, if you think about it, probably fits the modern university student perfectly. I Smart mean, move. <laughs> well, no, that would be a cheap. But, but uh, what, I, what interested me about the whole thing is, what is it, 2,300 students out of a student body of 50,000 was enough to uh, make, you know, to, total votes, not, not the difference, total votes. That's what, uh, you know, made the, uh, made the difference in this uh, so-called election. I... I, I'm, I, you know, you talk about, you know, poor election turnout. What the heck is that all about? <laughs> How many students there? Like 35, 40,000, or is it 50? Yeah, I'm pushing, yeah, yeah, something like that. That's, you know, I said it's in the tens of thousands, and you get 20, you know, 2,500 show up. But if you yeah. think about the mascot, right, they're supposed to kind of represent the student body. And well, a Mustang, as Gunrock was a Mustang, it's a noble creature, hard to be broken, free spirited, right? What's a cow? It's a herd animal. In nature, they're prey. In society, they're, you know, they're milked, slaughtered, and sold. Well, sounds like a university student to me. <laughs> but, 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 but James, it's not politically correct. Cows, beef, end up being hamburger. And how's that going to go over with the, uh, the, uh, the vegan uh, crowd? It's, it's not going to work. I, I, you know, I, they, it may, they may be the the cows for a while, but that's not going to last either. Well, yeah, the no. other thing is when you, when you think about it, they're blaming, they're blaming cows for an awful lot of global warming. Apparently yeah, cow, cow farts cow, cause global warming. What's that? Yeah, you know, cow, come on. Cow flatulence. So you would think flatulence. So you would think that, um, uh, uh, you know, perhaps they, uh, need to, uh, take a page out of the university of Santa Cruz. Uh, aren't they the banana slugs? The the University of Santa Cruz uh, yeah. school mascot is the banana slug. So yeah. perhaps they could pick uh, a nice uh, fungus or spore or something like that. Maybe uh, the tomato. You know, the third agriculture. That's what the Aggies are, right? For agriculture. So maybe they well, just get a tomato. Mostly animal husbandry. <laughs> I think that's their. That's what they make their meat and potatoes. Oh, no, animal husbandry. They've got a big wine. Even out, you know. Uh, wine uh, school now, uh, courtesy of the uh, of, a, of a, a wine company out of, out of Napa Valley. It's uh, you know they they cover the they cover the whole gamut. My uh, I, I know something I know somebody very well personally who graduated with a graduate degree in agriculture from UC Davis, and uh, uh, she worked in in uh, with nuts with almonds. Yes, I, I said that right. Mm. Almonds, almonds. Well, it depends on whether you're you're south of Stockton or north of Stockton, you know, whether they call it. We're north, and north of Stockton is Ammons, so don't argue with me. Yeah, all right, <laughs> all right. Uh, no, I, I, I know this uh, person well, and, uh, well, not nearly as well as you do, Richard, and, and no, it's a, a great, a great ag school, and I think, you know, with that kind of turnout, uh, you know, I'm I'm surprised that uh, they even bother. You know, really. I mean, uh, it certainly it certainly doesn't prove that uh, there was an overwhelming desire for sea change uh, in in the organization. Well, no, but, and the and you have to go to the alums, and I know some alums are not happy about the change because they like Gun Rock because you know it was part of their their youth, and so now they're changing to a cow. Everybody's all upset. Mm. <laughs> Betsy the cow or something. You know, I don't know. I've, I've lived down the road from UCD uh, for years, and I don't think I was ever aware that Gun Rock was their mascot. Just you knew it was the Mustangs, right? What? You knew they were Mustangs. Of course, with, with UC Davis, uh, uh, 
less than stellar uh, record in uh, intercollegiate sports. Not too many people pay attention anyway. Mm, no, they've done, they used to do pretty well in, in football. Um, but I think, you know, mostly it's a, it's a brain power school is it's very highly rated, you know, and lots of rich foreign folks send their kids there and pay the full ride. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's what, one of the things that makes, uh, you know, Davis so when school's in, when they're in classes, so delightfully cosmopolitan is the, is the huge number of uh, foreign, foreign students that... Uh, yeah, most, yeah, a lot, mostly Asian. I mean, you know, lived in Davis for many years, 20-some years, and uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, a... a Due to the student body, it's a, a, a very heavily Asian population, which yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in, makes the town a better place. It's got mm -hmm. uh, a lot of good Asian restaurants. It's got mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, uh, where else can you find a, a, a Nepalese, Nepalese uh, uh, store? Uh, you can't. No, Nepal no. maybe, yeah. Yeah, well, well, I think we could beat this one to death, bro. Yeah, no, tw yeah, we're starting by talking about restaurants in Davis. I think we've kind of gone way <laughs> over on this one. But Democrats don't seem to understand the economy, or do they, and they just can't say it? Because they're kind of avoiding inflation, right? Everybody but Democrats kind of sees the inflation, and Democrats kind of can still continue to downplay it. But also the risk of recession. We're already living in a recession. So anybody who doesn't understand that we're in a recession, it, you know, is blind. I guess it's just the best way to say it. blind. Or well, uh, officially, officially a recession is called by whoever makes the call after two quarters of e economic uh, slowdown. We've had one quarter of economic slowdown mm. uh, so far that's in the record books. I'm sure that uh, the second quarter will be uh, forthcoming, but we're not officially in a recession yet. But as you say, everybody pretty well knows because wages are going up but they're not going up nearly as fast as the price of uh, consumer goods. Look at gas, look at milk, look at, uh, oh, baby formula. Uh, so yeah, we're in a recession. Uh, <laughs> the problem for the Democrats is, uh, well, the problem for the Republicans is they don't have an answer because the inflation started, it, it's bipartisan. It's been going on ever since Greenspan was appointed uh, back in the 90s. And uh, they've been pumping up the money supply, which. You can't have inflation without an increased money supply. Now, I know that other factors uh, contribute to inflation, but without increased money supply, inflation doesn't happen. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the Greenspan, who was a Republican appointee, Bernanke, I think, was also a Republican appointee originally, Yellen, a Democratic appointee, and now Jerome Powell, who was a Trump appointee. All of them have been pumping up the money supply like... Uh, like uh, nobody's business and without you know with that eventually you get inflation particularly since under trump not biden trump originally he started shoveling money into the hands of consumers with stimmy payments and and uh, unemployment ben uh, bump ups uh, during the uh, the covid uh, thing uh, that's what got the money going away from financial assets i.e the stock market or the bond market and going directly into the price of gas, the price of, uh, of uh, consumer goods. And uh, Biden has done nothing to change that, but this is not a partisan issue. This is bipartisan, both partisans, Republicans and Democrats are squarely on the wrong side of the issue. So yeah, you might say it's a, it's a winning issue for Republicans, but not really because if voters have any memory at all, they'll realize it's been going on at least since Trump, and certainly, uh, arguably, since, uh, since uh, oh, I don't know, Bush the Younger. Hmm. Well, I think they, they, they don't have memories, but the, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, Richard, that, that it's, a, it's a duopoly problem. I mean, libertarians wouldn't put up with this nonsense. First of all, they wouldn't have a Fed. I think the only thing that libertarians and John Birchers agree on uh, there's a couple of things, but, um, you know, I mean, the, it, when you got the banksters running the regulatory agencies that regulate the banks and giving themselves permission to print money to make, you know, basically uh, ghost loans uh, and live off the fees, I mean, you're going to have problems. And, and it doesn't matter who's in charge of it, you know, it's the, the Fed is an independent regulatory agency in many respects. And, 
and it's not independent at all because it, it favors the powers that we let be. So, uh, but I, I do think that the, that the Dems um, are either blind to uh, what's of most concern <coughs> to um, most Americans, which is inflation. Uh, and then inflation, crime, uh, all sorts of other stuff. And, you know, they're, they're pitching the abortion issue as, as uh, you know, a big thing. They're just, you know, completely ignoring what most, most people are concerned about. Well, libertarians are divided on abortion. Uh, some are pro-choice, some are pro-life. And but libertarians come, in, come to it from a, uh, a standpoint of being honest, which is when does life begin? And mm. that's arguable. And mm. I think Roe v. Wade got it right. Life begins when it can't uh, support itself, out, you know, inside the womb or outside. Uh, and that's that's uh, you know for second trimester. Uh, so I you know I agree with uh, Roe v. Wade. You know I don't know about the legal reasoning whether it's all that sound, but the result I think was uh, a just and fair result. Mm. The Republicans are clearly shooting themselves in the foot because the majority of Americans. If, very large majority of Americans favor some form of abortion rights. Mm -hmm. Nobody supports, or very few people support abortion rights right up until uh, the day of delivery. But uh, most people support some sort of choice for the benefit of women, as mm -hmm. do I, and do mm -hmm. probably a majority of libertarians. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Republicans going uh, Texas, and now Oklahoma, which is Uh oh, we we lost Richard. Hmm. Um, well, actually, it's going to help on up. We're talking about we're talking about abortion. We'll kind of move down to the bottom of the list, but that's actually a good point because the abortion issue is it doesn't actually divide as easily as we like to think it does. Whether it's Republicans or Democrats, the abortion issue is actually highly complicated. Um, you know, women actually aren't in this universal agreement on for abortion rights. They actually they don't. They're, I was reading an article on five thirty eight the other day. It's quite complicated, but when it comes out in the importance of issues, it's abort for most people. Abortion is down on the bottom of the list. It's not something that most people have as their mm. most people have as a driving issue. Again, like John said, it's the economy, it's crime, it's education, it's all these other things that abortion is going to be five, six, tenth down on the list. And mm. and does the specifically does the left? In as John said, they're kind of going all for abortion. But I haven't heard much talk about Roe v. Wade, despite the fact that. On the streets, there's no real talk about it. Hmm. There's talk about it in the media, and there's talk about it in Democrat circles, but the rest of everybody's like, eh. <laughs> so is it going to be the issue that they think it is? You know, it's hmm. just... Well, I think it, you know, it, it might get... Uh, um, it, it either shows that the, uh, the, the Democrats are completely out of touch with, with uh, their own polling, uh, don't want to look at it, uh, or you know, they, they don't want to talk about inflation and crime and all the other things that's important to people. The border issue is important to a whole lot of people. Not to me as a libertarian. I don't care. You know, let the best and brightest come here and work hard. And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, let, let those folks who don't like it here leave. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty simple to me. Of course, if you leave and leave your citizenship behind in the United States, you basically have to pay a state tax on the way out, which is kind of cool. But um, I, I think it's a, a refusal to face reality. I understand the political bent to it, which means if they face it, they have to take some responsibility for it because they are the party in power. But uh, they're not going to do that. So, you know, they're not going to take responsibility for the inflation, for the crime, for the porous borders, that all these things that, that uh, you know, really bother folks. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. It's uh, – I'm not – you know, I certainly, I'm, I'm not a big Trump fan. I'm not, the only thing he did right was some deregulation as far as I'm concerned, because tariffs yeah. are a joke. They just hurt consumers. They don't help anybody. Um, and, uh, you know, the border stuff, you know, basically that's just rabble rousing. Um, you know, I still, and this, this sounds politically cynical, I don't think Putin would have uh, invaded the Ukraine if Trump was president. I don't think he'd have done it. But then again, apparently, uh, you know, Biden forgot again that we're, we're not allies with Taiwan. 
Um, so, you know, anyway. Yeah, well, you know, it's being unpredictable has its advantages, right? Trump was unpredictable. And if you're unpredictable, you know, people are going to be less likely to kind of cause problems because they don't know how you're going to respond. Hmm. Oh, Biden, you, you know, Biden administration knew exactly how they were going to respond. There was hmm. no, there was no uh, secret there. And so that was part of the part of that problem. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, but speaking of kind of power has has wokeism. The special privilege, Disney in, in has lost their kind of their special privileges in, in um, oh, in Florida, the special yeah. tax district in Florida, the special tax privileges they get in Florida. But has it kind of run its course? Netflix has now is after losing subscribers, they've now fired. Well, laid off uh, like 300 employees and they're claiming it's the most woke employees because they've canceled a bunch of uh, upcoming shows because they were too woke. And so has this wokeism kind of run its course? Has the, has the money issue, has it saying, well, we're losing money so we can no longer be woke, get woke, go broke. Is it, they're finally going broke, I guess is the question. Hmm. Well, I think, I think uh, uh, Richard's being very still again. I'm a little worried when he's that still. <laughs> um, anyway, it's uh, I. I am glad to see Netflix. Uh, I was. It was lovely to see Netflix make the statement that you know you're going to work at this company. Uh, you're going to be asked to work on some some um, you know endeavors that you don't agree with. And uh, if you have a problem with that, maybe uh, you should work somewhere else. Maybe Netflix isn't the place for you. So the I. I think. Uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, I think I I feel, and I'm not seeing a lot of hard numbers supporting it, that that uh, people, you know, don't want uh, you know media, especially, to uh, manipulate the message. You know, they don't want to be uh, censored. They don't want to be guided. They don't want people to tell them that. You can't watch this because it's not LBGTQ, whatever it is, appropriate. Uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, um, um, this is not in keeping with our, our thoughts on lots of stuff. I think people want a choice. And, and I think probably the best example of that is the most popular show being produced and watched by the most people in this country right now is a show called Yellowstone. And and it's about uh, it's a it's a big drama, but it's about uh, issues that are, are important to people, uh, you know, west of the Mississippi, you know, like land use and government regulation and all the rest of that stuff. And and it has some pretty hardcore libertarian slash robber baron. Robber baron is a good thing, by the way. Look it up. In it and and doesn't get any awards, doesn't get any recognition, just takes money to the bank, and you know that's because all the people controlling uh, all of these awards and these award shows and everything else are woke as hell and far left. So, I think American public is getting the consumers are getting tired of having these people have a stranglehold on what they watch and listen to, and I think that's a good thing. If you want to call it the end of wokeism, then that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what's really irritating is for me personally is you watch these people on, on this on the uh, complain about you know the companies getting special privileges and whatnot. But when you try to take away Disney's privileges, they wear up and complain that oh no, you can't take away Disney's special privilege tax privileges districts. You can't you can't remove the special privileges we've given to them already. We want to complain about the special privileges, but we don't want to actually do anything about the special mm. privileges. We just want to complain about the special privileges the government gives these companies. And that's just really irritating because, you know, these there's the same group of people who complain about, oh, big business, oh, corporations, oh, all this. Oh, no, you can't take Disney's special privileges away. But part of the other thing is Disney's might lose some uh, – so their – oh, what? Their copyrights to some of their old characters because you know how Disney's gotten some special compensation. Um, what is it? Not compensation. What's the word I'm looking for, John? Dispensation. Dispensation yeah. consi consideration yeah. for their for their iconic or their old iconic characters that would normally have been into the public domain by now, yeah. right? For every if you and I had created a character, they would have been into the public domain by now. But because well, it's no, Disney, corporations get a longer lifespan on their characters. But it's Steamboat Willie. 
is getting ready to expire, but they don't use Steamboat Willie. And every time they have a new re iteration of a character, uh, then it gets the same lifespan. But why should a corporation's interest in uh, a likeness or, or in verbs, because I'm a writer, um, no, by the time my books get published, I'll have to be 150 for it to expire. Uh, and uh, no, a little bit less than that, folks. So, um, you know, it's, it's weird. Um, there are all, special interest groups have always had their way in this country. And, you know, as long as, as you have regulatory agencies that, that uh, can influence in, in um, uh, special interest favors, it's going to continue. The libertarian, uh, the libertarian response to that is basically just say, treat everybody the same or have no rules. But I understand having uh, copyright and patent, you know, but I think 50 years is enough. I don't think you need 99 years or 75 years. 50 years is enough. Well, and especially with how fast information moves and things change today, uh, you know, it's a vastly different landscape. If you haven't gotten the money out of your, your project in 20, 30 years now, you're not going to really, it's time to move on, right? Mm -hmm. Unlike the old days where it took 10 years to to kind of get your stuff out there. It took so long to get your, your art, your, your work out. And about that having a long period of time to be able to take advantage of it makes more sense. But nowadays you're, you're out and out there in days, hours, minutes, not, not well, years. For some folks, not, not all of us, but for some folks. Yeah. 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 Well, and so maybe there's a way, maybe a digital art bitch is treated differently than something else, mm -hmm. but you know, I don't know. There's a gotta be some better ways to do that, but talking about better ways to do this, John, we're going to, Boomers are no longer the bosses. And this was just something that caught me. This is kind of a personal thing. It's just got really nothing to politics. But there was listening to the millennials and Gen Zs are complaining that boomers are making them come back to work. But boomers are retired. The boomers are not the ones. It's people like me, the 50-year-olds, the 60-year-olds are making you come back to work. Can you even get your insults right? I just, you know. It's not boomers making you go back to work. It's people in their fifties and sixties. <laughs> well, I yeah, and and I I found that hilarious too because they're you know they're talking about people don't trust us and they think we have to be in the office to do work and we need to do that so we do more work and they and they self-identify and say, uh, well, I'm way more effective than I am at home. And one of the people in in one of the things we watched as research for this said. Uh, Hold on a second, I gotta stop the interview. My husband's having a little issue with the child, so um, hold on a second while I go help him out here. So she's working from home, and one of the reasons she pitches is so she can spend more time with her children. And in her interview about how she quit her job because they wanted her to go into work, and she says she works much better at home and is much more efficient, she pauses the interview so she can go take care of her kid. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that there's a, a, a huge amount of interaction with coworkers that is, uh, provides, uh, you know, learning and expertise and feedback and uh, advice uh, and, uh, you know, people tearing your ideas apart and forcing you to support all the rest of it. There's so many good things that happen. You know, when people are together in an office environment, and I also agree that you can get work done from home. But, you know, if it's a, if it's a business and the, and, and the business is looking at it and, and says that, no, people are more effective and efficient in doing what we do if you come into the office, then look for another line of work. But, you know, don't don't say it's uh, it's baby boomers problem you know it's a it's a managerial issue and if the managers and owners of the company decide you need to be at work to do your job more effectively then you need to be at work and and if you don't want to do that find another job pretty simple yeah, and some jobs are better suited like if you're a customer service you're answering phones and you're just helping customer service that's more suited to being at home where you can just yeah. sit on your headphones and your computer and you don't really have interaction but if you have a creative job or if you have jobs where you're problem solving teams you need to be able to walk into the hey Bob and deal with it right away. There is there is a different there's a different feeling. There's a different attitude, and so it really it has to depend on the culture of the business, the type of work you're doing, and all these various factors. You can't just say well, I work from home is best or work from the office is best. 
really it's you have to find out what's best for that company and that culture right it's you know i i, I keep getting kicked off there's a, a tropical storm moving through uh belize so i i get i keep getting kicked off the air uh with the power outages but i'm back now i don't know if you've mentioned this yet but this is something that the market will sort out eventually uh people who are more efficient and can uh, work better at home will find a company that uh, allows them to do so uh and uh you know there's companies like slack and other and zoom and so forth that make it easy to collaborate from uh, remote locations uh i'm i'm a great believer in uh, uh working from home i think it makes a heck of a lot of sense for most companies but there are certain things like you know laying bricks or uh, things that require that you're on the job site you just can't do it and uh, that's something the market will sort out just let it hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, this is essentially the market sorting out. We've got a couple minutes, so we're going to go. Biden flew in some from plant. Biden flew in some uh, a handful, dropping the bucket essentially of of uh, baby formulas. But they never want to address that the real problem is here that the FDA doesn't trust mothers to read European and Canadian labels. That's why we have a shortage, right? The government mm -hmm. closed down a plant and refused to allow in uh, exports imports in from Canada and and uh, Europe. Not because it's dangerous, not because they're no any better, but because we can't find somehow manage to read the labels properly. Somehow the labels. Yeah, it's, it's nanny is a matter of worst. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I grew up on cow's milk for God's sake. Uh, as soon as I quit nursing, and uh, somehow or another, I managed to survive. There's absolutely no reason at all for the uh, uh, shortage of formula, other than the fact the government is just getting in the damn way. That's all it is. One hundred percent no other reason well and i i think that 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 might be the focus for the end of the show and every single problem we can bring up uh i think that we could say uh it, it wouldn't be a problem if the, the government just got out of the damn way uh you know being libertarians i think we can um i'd be hard pressed to find a problem that's uh you know causing people real harm that the government didn't either create or exacerbate or a problem that didn't get a whole lot worse uh without government attempt to help whatever the problem was normally it's a government created problem that they turned into a nightmare and a disaster by by their interference so uh, yeah. you know, this well, big, yeah. the formula thing is a perfect example yeah, because formula you can you should be able to set up a formula factory in a, in a small warehouse and produce for your local community relatively quickly, but you can't do it because of government regulations and red tape and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and a lot of it is protectionism. Uh, Abbott and a, and the, a few other people who are part of the oligopoly don't want any damn competition, and so they're using government regulation to prevent competition. That's that's at the heart of it, and they are the big campaign contributors, and uh, they get their way. And we got to get our way. We are out of time. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Richard, thank you for joining us from Belize. We appreciate it. John, thank you for getting out of your sick bed for, for a day for us. We go back to bed and we are out of here. Thank you for joining us. And please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m.